Welcome back everyone. It is another week, another video, another topic. This week um, I'm doing something a little different again. I'm kind of jumping around, trying things as they come to me. But this one I've been thinking about for a while. This one is about one book and there's a specific reason why I'm talking about this one book. I actually literally just finished reading it and the emotions, the emotions. I was unprepared. The book in question is called Beside the Bonnie Briar Bush by Ian McLaren. This was published in 1895, so it's one of those old ones with, mm, yeah, it's got a little bit of that old book smell. Not too much, not too much, because this one is in really good condition, so it's not super broken down or anything, but it's, it's got a little bit of that. The reason I am highlighting this one in particular, ignore my bookmarks, the reason I'm highlighting this one in particular is because this was the first book when Publishers Weekly started their list of yearly bestsellers. This was number one. A bit of background on the book and the author. Ian McLaren was the pen name of John Watson, who lived from 1850 to 1907. He studied at Edinburgh University and became a minister. He worked uh, several places, several churches, including in one in Perthshire, which uh, may have served as a basis for his stories. That's an area in Scotland. Um, I don't know much about it, just what I looked up on Wikipedia. So if anybody out there is a Perthshire, Perthshire expert, um, if you want to fill in more, I would be much obliged. It was while traveling in the United States that he came down with tonsillitis, which led to blood poisoning and death, again at age 57. We don't know too much about his life other than that. One interesting thing is that he may have coined the phrase, still popular today, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. The earliest definite instance of this phrase that we can find that's been recorded is this author's quote from an 1897 issue of British Weekly. Uh, to be exact, be pitiful for every man is fighting a hard battle. This particular book, Beside the Bonnie Briar Bush, was his first. It sold over 700,000 copies, which was not too bad for back in the day. His other books include The Days of Auld Lang Syne, Kate Carnegie and Those Ministers, and Afterwards and Other Stories. There's also The Upper Room, The Mind of the Master, and The Potter's Wheel. Those are collected sermons. He had several other books other than that. A very successful author in his time. Now, I wasn't sure what to expect when I picked this up. It starts with um, a young man called George. He is studying to become a minister, and he has been picked up on by the local school teacher, who makes it his mission to cite out uh, young uns, specifically the boys, um, it being the time and all, and to promote college to them, and to try and get them to be the very best to excel in all their studies, so that uh, the village, Drumtokti, I'm going to say that wrong, but that's what I'm going with, Drumtokti can be, you know, super proud and have a great reputation. Uh, George, I thought we were going to go with him throughout the whole story, but this is not George's story. In fact, he, uh, I'm going to have a lot of spoilers here, he dies early on. And this, the book is actually about the village. It's one of those slice of life things um, where we just happen in on different characters and find out a little bit more about them before we move on to something else. Now, what's really neat is Drumtakti is a real place, or at least there's a Drumtakti forest and a Drumtakti castle. Uh, again, I don't know much about them. I looked them up. I'm probably saying them wrong. But again, if anyone knows more about them, that's really cool. That's really interesting. Now, the book itself, first of all, 
I got this on eBay. So, you know, there are a lot of copies out there. Um, there's the occasional one where somebody was overly optimistic and they're offering it for hundreds of dollars in some pristine condition or something like that, which I don't know of anybody who's looking for this book in pristine condition, but hey, you know, they're trying. Uh, so this one I picked up for about 10 bucks on eBay. It is in very good condition, considering it doesn't look like it's been read too much, which is kind of a shame because there is a dedication in the front. It says, this is so sweet, a birthday gift for Mama from Erskine, July 3rd, 1896. And it says again, from Erskine down here. So this was a new book. It had only been out for a year or so when Erskine picked it up for his mama and gave it to her for Christmas. I'm kind of thinking Erskine must have been a kid since he refers to her as mama and not mother. So very thoughtful. Um, I would presume that she read it, but again, not that much. Maybe she didn't like it or maybe she didn't just didn't have time to read, which is entirely possible. But I love seeing these personal things in old books. Um, again, it shows you that the book has a history to it that really personalizes it, brings it home, as it were. As to the characters, there's quite an extended bit about the minister. Now, Drumtakti is a small village quite removed from anywhere. It's got the hills around it and moors. There's the Drumtakti River which becomes very difficult to pass in pretty much any sort of weather. People manage it, but yes, yeah, so they're quite removed. Very, very country sort of town. So church is a big part of their life. And so they spend a lot of time talking about the different ministers that they've gone through. Um, so we get to hear quite a bit about the different ministerial styles, the way they preach their sermons and all that, and the way the villagers just pick them apart, pick them to pieces, but they, they still support them and they really want them to do well. Again, the author was a minister, so you really feel that experience coming through. I, I looked up about the author, saw he was a minister, and it just, even if I hadn't known, you can tell, you can tell by reading it that these are fictionalized accounts of things that he experienced. Maybe not the whole thing, sure, it is fiction, but a lot of it rings pretty true as far as people who are people, very human. So there's, again, there's the school teacher, there are the ministers, there are the people in the congregation, uh, which is pretty much the whole town. There's the lady who sits there and makes it her mission to pick apart everything the minister says, and then she'll give the rundown to everybody else as to what her judgment is. And there's one minister who just bounces all over the place in his sermon and quite floors her. She she can't even come up with anything to say. She can't pick it apart properly because she's like, I couldn't even follow it. There are humorous parts like that. Then, for example, the whole end, the whole ending part, is on the doctor, is on the doctor that sees to this town and sees to the surrounding area. He lives on land provided by the local lord, and the lord doesn't charge him anything because of the service he provides. The doctor goes around on his horse. He does this for 40 years, and the town could not do without him. It's an amazing portrait of this man who makes it his mission to fight off death when and if he possibly can do anything. He will do his utmost. If he can't, he will be honest with you. But hmm, at the very end, age catches up with him and he passes away. And that's where the emotions come in. I just, I had to keep stopping and going, oh, wow. Oh, no. Oh, oh, my goodness. Let me refer to a couple of parts here. So I got the bookmarks. The interesting thing is that this is a very Scottish novel. Um, in keeping with the times, a lot of books like these were written in dialect. So it can be tricky. I had to slow down a little bit when people were talking, going, okay, and sometimes read it out loud just to get the idea of, oh, that's what they're saying. <laughs> okay. It made it very interesting. 
Okay. Here's a part I'm going to read where the doctor and another man he counts as his friend, he's roped him in to save a third man's life. This man has been taken with a fever. He's on his deathbed. The big doctor from the local city or local-ish city happened to be in town. He checked the man and said, oh, he's got six hours at most. Nothing can save him. But the country doctor said, this man's pretty strong. I think I can help him pull through, but we have to stick by him. And they've done that. It was the hour before daybreak, and Drumshoe, the doctor's friend, wandered through fields he had trodden since childhood. The cattle lay sleeping in the pastures, their shadowy forms with a patch of whiteness here and there having a weird suggestion of death. He heard the burn running over the stones. Fifty years ago he had made a dam that lasted till winter. The hooting of an owl made him start. One had frightened him as a boy so that he ran home to his mother. She died thirty years ago. The smell of ripe corn filled the air. It would soon be cut and garnered. He could see the dim outlines of his house, all dark and cold. No one he loved was beneath the roof. The lighted window in Saunders' cottage told where a man hung between life and death, but love was in that home. The futility of life arose before this lonely man and overcame his heart with an indescribable sadness. What a vanity was all human labor. What a mystery all human life. <clears throat> oh, just moments like that were, oh, that's put so well. It doesn't get me emotional as such, but it just... Like, wow, I have to sit a moment and say, that is a wonderfully put thought. I do love a wonderfully put thought. Anyway, back to the doctor once the doctor passes away. He does so in the dead of winter. And Drumshoe is the man beside his bed, uh, reading him the Psalms and whatnot as he passes on. The doctor doesn't think that, he thinks maybe Drumshoe and few other people might show up to his funeral. Over a hundred people come to his funeral. Considering there's a giant snowstorm that week, many more people would have made it, and many struggled through the drifts from neighboring villages. And the Lord, where the doctor's house is, the one who lets him have it rent-free, the Lord comes down from his castle to the funeral. It's the habit of the tough men of the village or tough people of the village. Not only not to, they try not to show any emotion, but they also tend to go without overcoats or anything like that, no matter the weather. So the Lord removes his overcoat and stands there among the men. The minister says, it's mighty cold. Some of you are old. You might want to cover your heads at the very least. And the Lord speaks up for all the men. And he says, no, the doctor endured worse than this for us. The least we can do is give him these few minutes. That's how much esteem this man was held in the village. That was another emotional moment. <laughs> what a character. And if we're lucky, we all get to know someone like that in our lives. I also just wanted to bring up, again, <laughs> there's a lot of, I'll, I'll just show you a close-up. There is a lot of dialect in here. And let me just mention what you will be in for if you try to read this book. Um, so if you have trouble reading regularly, um, you know, just reading, not like, audiobooks or anything, then you might want to see if you can find an audio version of this. I don't know if there is one. If there is, I'll look and I'll try to put a link down in the description. If not, I could try and make one maybe. If you could deal with my bad Scottish reading, you're, I'll give you a taste of it. And again, I, I, some of these I don't know how to say, but I'll do the best I can. If he had not a pocket of peppermints, but it wasn't that wild else he's hurt. Nay, nay, dogs and barons can read folks' faces and make no mistakes. As soon as I saw a lack in, I kent he was a new man. Oh my goodness, it goes on and on like that. <laughs> so, yes, it can be a little tricky to make a dent, but it does give you a flavor of who these people are, where they're from, how they talk. 
So this is a pretty good book overall, especially that last part. I would say it takes some work to get into, especially if you didn't know what to expect going in. But so it's a little uneven. But overall, I think it's worth it uh, <laughs> because of the the emotions it sets off. And again, it's just a wonderful slice of life of a small Scottish town. And even though it doesn't get super in-depth, the doctor is the, the most in-depth it gets. You still feel like these are people you know. Like, even in real life, you, <laughs> you know somebody like this person or that person. So there's enough there to be getting on with. And I just want to read one more section because that really gives a wonderful flavor of this place. We had tender words also that still bring the tears to my eyes, and chief among them was Kauthi, I'm approximating. That's my guess. What did it mean? It meant a letter to some tired townsman, written in homely scotch, and bidding him come to get new life from the Drumtoctier, and the grip of an honest hand on the Kildrummy platform whose warmth lasted till you reached the glen, and another welcome at the garden gate that mingled with the scent of honeysuckle, and moss roses, and thyme, and carnations, and the best of everything that could be given you, and motherly nursing and an illness, with skilly remedies of the olden time, and wise cheery talk that spake no ill of man or God, and loud reproaches if you propose to leave under a month or two, and absolute conditions that you must return, and a load of country dainties for a bachelor's bare commons, and far more that cannot be put into words of hospitality, and kindness, and quietness, and restfulness, and loyal friendship of hearts now turned to dust in the old kirkyard. I hope I've given a good enough explanation of this book. Maybe you'll want to check it out sometime, because it really is pretty cool. And again, the first official bestseller in the United States listed by Publishers Weekly anyway. I know there have been other lists, but this is the oldest one I could find that actually had a, a published list, official listing. I'll be going through the whole list eventually. I can't wait, and I hope you stick with me. <laughs> I will see you next time. Have a good one. Bye. Hello, doggy. Hello! Oh, look at you. Look at you, Mr. YouTube star. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> you don't care. You're a dog. <laughs>